Hello and good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome from the Heinrich Böhr Foundation here in the Brussels office. I'm Martin Keim, heading the European Energy Transition Program here in the Brussels office, and I'm very delighted today to uh, moderate this event on the, of the series of Worldwide Pandemic European Responses. Uh, today we will talk a lot about mobility and transport issue. Um, today's session is, is actually called European Mobility in the Context of COVID-19, uh, Keeping the Green Steering Wheel Steady. And uh, we named this, we, we choose this name for, for a reason. Um, why that is, we will definitely have to have a, a lot of time later to talk about that. But uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce my very distinguished um, panelists today. Uh, I am delighted. I'm delighted and honoured to um, to have on board um, with me. Uh, first of all, Annika Degen from the German office of the, from the EU office from the German uh, Federation of German Public Transport Companies uh, here in Brussels. Thank you for joining us, Annika. Um, then I am delighted to uh, have Matthew Baldwin from the European Commission. Um, from he, he's the Deputy Director General in, in the DG Move, which is the department um, which is responsible for for transport and mobility. Thank you for joining us, Matthew. Uh, later, we will also have the great honor to be joined by uh, George uh, George <laughs> George Gilkinet, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Mobility and the National Railway of Belgium. Um, it's a great pleasure to have him on board. I think he will join us in a bit. So just before we start off this panel, allow me to uh, say a few words about uh, the situa situation we are in and, and what brings us to, to this um, momentum of a, of a very um, complex picture of, on the one hand, having the situation of a global pandemic, and on the other hand, being forced uh, in a way to think to rethink mobility in, in ways we haven't thought about before. Um, precisely that is also one of the main tasks here the main tasks here in, in Brussels in our office and I'm, I'm very happy to, to announce to you already the forthcoming European Mobility Atlas which will be presented next year in, in February and so a lot of topics and questions that will be raised today and addressed today will also be taken care of and addressed in the Mobility Atlas. But first of all, let me start with Ms. Annika Degen, uh, who I just introduced to you, and give her the chance for a rough five to ten minutes uh, to give us a, a short input on, on her take on COVID-19 and, and mobility, what, it, what is actually at stake. Okay. Um, thank you very much for this kind introduction and the opportunity to join your panel today. Um, so I'm representing transport companies from Germany. Um, VDV has around 600 members who offer public transport and rail freight services. Um, so as it's commonly known, I mean, for our transport companies, the past nine months were difficult. Transport demand, both in freight and especially in passenger transport, has decreased significantly. Um, so we have experienced or we are experiencing until the end of the year um, Fairbox revenue losses in pu local public transport of around 3.5 billion euros and in long distance passenger rail um, transport uh, more than 1.5 billion euros as well as rail freight which has like 300 to 600 million euros of losses because of the COVID crisis. So this is quite a huge impact. And um, in the month of April, we saw that um, the number of passengers was reduced by about 70 to 80 percent compared to the year before. And then over the course of the months um, of the summer, uh, the demand went up again. We reached levels of up to 80% of the normal passenger numbers um, by August and September. But now, uh, with the second lockdown, if I may call it this way, um, we see that the numbers are dropping again. And for November and December, we expect that in passenger transport to see only 50 to 60% of the normal uh, numbers that we would see in previous years. Um, so it's, it's really a shame because uh, over the past decades, the trend was really to see increasing numbers of passengers in public transport. Um, although uh, the percentage of the overall population um, who use public transport stayed more or less stable. So there was not a huge uh, shift towards public transport neither. Um, but in recent years, 
we see that there is a stronger concern with climate change and air pollution as well as congestion in cities and we really see more and more cities calling for modal shift they want to change the mobility in their territory so this was actually a, a perfect opportunity together with the european green deal to turn things around and to improve the mobility system overall and to uh, see finally uh, you know a larger shift towards active mobility walking and cycling as well as shared and public mobility like public transport um, so while this trend was interrupted to some extent by the COVID-19 crisis it is now more important than ever to uh, continue working on modal shift because I mean first of all climate change is not waiting and we see that in the end all the problems we experience the pandemic as well as the environmental problems are interlinked so climate change is not waiting and it, it requires fast and and very ambitious um, policy making and there also seems to be a link between air pollution and the severity of covid cases so here again um, i think it is important and quite urgent to reduce the most polluting transport modes um, and this urge is stronger now than it was before. Um, let me also add that public transport is an essential public service which offers mobility to all citizens. It connects them to their workplace and uh, it is offered at affordable prices which is especially relevant in the current economic crisis that we see. Um, studies in the past have shown that every euro invested in public transport uh, creates five times its value in terms of the local economy and the benefit it brings to the local economy. So public transport investments can also really help with economic recovery, which is another argument in favor of it. Um, let me perhaps say a word about um, the mobility behavior we see. Um, you know, you have asked uh, us uh, prior to this event about um, how we deal with people avoiding public transport. and. I understand if people at the moment avoid any crowded places really and and obviously public transport uh, in public transport you're going to meet other people um, but I can assure you that uh, we've looked into this over all these months and we see that a growing number of studies suggest um, that there's clearly no link between public transport and the spread of COVID-19, at least not more than anywhere else in the public space where you simply meet and interact with other people um, why is why is transport COVID safe it is um, for, for a number of reasons people use public transport only for a short while and we saw in many studies that the length of you lingering in a certain place in a closed place especially is determining uh, how much exposure you have to the virus so because people hop on a bus and after a number of minutes they hop off again and they have arrived um, this you know avoids them being exposed to to any uh, potential virus for a long time then people don't speak much and we also saw in studies that the you know the exchange and speaking um, expels the virus from one person to another then there's air conditioning ventilation through open windows and opening the doors and our bus companies open all the doors now throughout the pandemic not just one um, in order to let um, the, the air circulate then there are hygiene measures in, in place such as regular disinfecting and cleaning and of course the wearing masks is a very important element uh, both in the vehicles and in the stations and this is really um, implemented by the customers in Germany so we have um, fortunately absolutely no problem uh, with people only a very very low percentage of people uh, not wearing their mask properly in public transport so all these things together um, lead to the fact that we can really say that um, anybody who claims that the virus is uh, transmitted in public transport more than in other places is is factually wrong so instead of this um, i think we should uh, really work together to um, win again the trust of customers to come back and return to public transport if they uh, were skeptical for a while um, so perhaps the last statement on our policy expectations. Um, VDV has also, uh, like other associations, um, worked on a position paper um, looking at the European Union's um, strategy for smart and sustainable mobility that is coming up in December. And um, we have uh, looked especially at three challenges, climate change, 
um, the COVID crisis and digitalization as the three most relevant, let's say, aspects to, to look at and to suggest policies about. And I personally think that climate change is really the number one challenge because it will um, depend very much on our generation whether or not we can turn things around. We can definitely not wait for another decade uh, going on with business as usual and then see what we can do in 10 years. So um, the Commission has estimated that in transport we have to reduce 90% of transport related greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So that's a huge way and I think that every year counts on the way to get there. And it cannot be achieved by business as usual. So um, we really advocate for the avoid, shift and improve principle because I personally am convinced that we should look at all these three possibilities to turn things around and all contributions together might finally bring about the big change that we need to see. Um, so in terms of improving, I think the European Commission, for instance, has already done quite a lot, especially if we look at, um, you know, road transport, we see um, new technologies, uh, digital technologies being uh, promoted, alternative fuels being promoted. The digitalization also helps in the railway sector very much. So this is very welcome. Um, in terms of shift, we see um, in Europe that uh, there was um, the aim to shift some of the long distance um, trips to railways, for instance, which is very welcome. And I think this should continue also in the upcoming year of rail. 2021. Um, but I think that uh, we also need to look at, look more, you know, under the shift angle and uh, in terms of different allocation of road space, um, who gets how much time and space on the road, the internalization of external costs, we have to set the right incentives to get people out of their private vehicles and really into shared mobility and more active mobility. And um, this has to be done. And then in terms of avoid, I think this is really kind of a hot tomato. Nobody really dares at talking about avoiding transport because it can be misunderstood as um, institutions telling the people to stay at home and not to travel, which I think is a misunderstanding. But um, there are lots of ways in which avoiding transport can be promoted and, um, and really facilitated. Um, we can look at which trips can be avoided simply through better planning or using empty capacities. Um, if you look at freight, you know, uh, we should avoid um, trucks running empty on the on the streets, but really try to um, put a system in place where capacities are used if a vehicle is going anyways into a certain direction. And um, I think that also the alternatives, like thinking twice about which trips are really needed and which could be replaced through video conferencing, um, got some, uh, well, some positive experience actually during the COVID crisis. So um, there are many ways in which avoiding transport can be explored um, without uh, prohibiting mobility. So we in VDB would actually like to see more mobility, but less transport. So mobility in a more efficient way. Um, so the Commission said all initiatives that are coming up in the future must support the Green Deal. And I think this is a very good, um, very good indication of which way we should go. And we must achieve a significant model shift towards railways and public transport and active mobility already by 2030. This would be my plea. And let me stop here and um, maybe get back on more details during the discussion. Thank you very much, Annika. Thank you for this very comprehensive uh, overlook already of, of, of setting the scene. Um, First of all, a very warm welcome now to Georges Quignier, who is, uh, as I said, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for, of Mobility in the National Railway of Belgium. We are delighted to have you on board here. Um, before I go on and hand the floor over to you, um, Georges, I will just quickly also um, say a, 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 few, a, um, a quick word on the comment section. Um, the, to remind you, the event is co-hosted by the, the Heinrich Böll Foundation and the, the Green European Foundation, and my colleagues from the Green European Foundation have kindly are taking kindly charge of the comment section and the technical background. And so, if you have questions, questions, the panelists, please use the comment section and um, put them in in the put your questions in there. So uh, now, without further ado, uh, thank you very much for joining us, Josh, and the floor is no, is yours now. Thanks a lot. Uh, nice to see you and to, and to hear you. I'm uh, Minister for Mobility f for six weeks. 
I don't know uh, everything about uh, about it, but I have a quite a clear view uh, of, of the situation. And also, as a deputy prime minister, and we have a lot of a lot of of things to do uh, with the COVID crisis. Um, this crisis is a crisis like we. Uh, uh, I've uh, never seen the most severe crisis since uh, the Second uh, Worldwide uh, War. And, and uh, th this crisis affects all of, us, all of us in many ways. In the short term, the crisis reveals all the inequalities of, of our society, domestic violence, clusters in uh, vulnerable groups, and loneliness of older people, uh, as a consequence, there are many emergencies, emergencies to be uh, deal with for our government. Uh, sanitary, uh, ensure hospitals can deal with the second wave. Economic, job and revenue losses. Or psycho-related health issues like loneliness, de depression. Uh, this crisis, uh, like in uh, other countries, also impacts the mobility of people and goods. And uh, in my opinion, there are three prior priorities regarding transport and mobility. The first one is the, the question of the security in the transport. Ensure that people can still circulate safely. We have implemented many protocols uh, with uh, our railway uh, company in public transportation, with, uh, which enable our population to still use buses, trains, metros, and trams. Uh, second priority is uh, to let people move. Uh, uh, you have, we have to reserve transport for the people we really need, uh, the ones uh, that cannot work from uh, home. This is crucial because uh, essential jobs tend to be performed by more vulnerable people. I think of nurses, care assistants, cashiers, garbage collector, but also students who have to go to, to school because in Belgium we have uh, we made the, the choice like, like in other countries to let our schools open. It is uh, very important for the, the young girls of, of us. And three, uh, we, will, we want to ensure that no one is left behind. Uh, more generally, uh, and this is closely link linked uh, to uh, my previous point, the most exposed group, women or the people, self-employed people, must not be left behind during this crisis, especially not by political decision. The way we manage this crisis as Belgian authority reveals and defines who we are as society. And of course, in a long-term perspective, as ecologists, we want the post-COVID world to be different from the pre-crisis situation. Uh, we don't want to relaunch the economy as it was before because uh, it will never ever be the same again, but rather we deployed our society on ecological grounds. This crisis is clearly a treat for our societies, but can and must be an opportunity to make societies greener, fairer, more democratic and more uh, resilient. I don't know if I have to answer the the, the question which were uh, uh, we can we can come back to these later actually it's uh, okay it's not... it was it was my, my introduction thank you very much for this thank you very much Ms. um george Duclinet. um so it was that mobility rather than transport um matthew baldwin do you agree let me uh give you the chance to uh, provide us with a, a short input from the commission well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, great to be. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not Harold Reuters in so many ways, but uh, I am who I am, and I'm Matthew Baldwin, and I am delighted to be with you. I'm the um, coordinator for road safety and sustainable mobility, so uh, this subject's are right on point for me. And I think the trouble, the problem we're going to have in this panel is we're all going to agree far too much, but uh, that's life. Um, I, I like the slogan. I'll take it with me, uh, Anika. Uh, we are writing, as you mentioned, a new uh, strategy for sustainable and smart uh, mobility. Um, uh, we're always uh, always on the market for a good new slogan in the European Commission. Right? <laughs> I like it. Um, just to briefly say a few words uh, on top of what's already been said. Um, 
COVID's had uh, a massive impact, as has already been said, on uh, European transport and European society. Um, and it's had an impact on what we do. Um, just to give you one illustration of that, when if you think back to the the days of March, when uh, we had we started to see panic buying in a lot of European stores, people worrying, not just being uh, selfish, but people worrying that essential goods and medicines were not going to get through. And uh, what we did, we stepped in at the European level to say, okay, we need to keep those supply chains open. We need to keep keep freight moving across national frontiers. And we came with this concept called the green lanes, uh, which says that um, as a goal, that there should be delays of no more than 15 minutes for a truck going across national frontiers. And we're very proud of what's been achieved. I think in 90% of the big border crossings of Europe, that target's been achieved. And the signal then is all the way back down the supply chains to everybody that the goods will be in the stores. You don't need to uh, take all the toilet paper or all the milk, it's going to come through. And, and I think it's been a, a, an important lesson for all of us about the signals we can send to European society about keeping supply chains moving. Um, the second sort of general set of comments, uh, and by the way, um, we're going to broaden that into a multimodal green lanes, which is exciting, to, to make that concept work also for rail freight, to make it uh, for the short sea shipping, and also for thinking about aviation freight as, as well. Um, I also want to pick up what Annika was saying about public transport, which is a very different angle to come in on. And here to talk about the plight a little bit of the public transport uh, operators and the public transport workers. Um, I mean, the numbers I have are really startling that uh, EU public transport is losing up to 90% of its rider revenues by the end of 2020, which is about 40 billion euros. Uh, terrible numbers from individual cities as well. And, and Annika gave some numbers from the German perspective. And this is partly because you as public transport operators have kept the system going. You've kept the essential services moving. I mean, right here in Brussels, you know, the trams and the buses have rumbled through the night to keep uh, the essential workers that the minister has mentioned, the nurses, in their posts. And, and let's be clear, some of these bus drivers have died as a result of COVID. Um, and we shouldn't forget this. We should never forget the transport workers, including the seafarers, um, who have been stuck in many cases in different parts of the world with expired visas. And again, at the European level, we need to do what we can to help them. Um, and I like also what Annika said about the, the, um, the perception of risks. And I think that applies in lots of different areas. Uh, in public transport, um, I entirely agree with it. Every study I've read shows that we can, and I'm, congratulations, Minister, you are applying the safety protocols for Belgian public transport. Nothing in this new terrible life is risk-free, but we need to make sure that taking a bus, taking a plane is no worse than a trip to the supermarket or no worse in terms of risk. Um, and that way we can slowly, little by little, when we're not in, in lockdown mode, get back to, to normal society. And I think that's very important because if we don't do that, the risk is the new normal is going to be worse than the old normal um, and that we will have less active mobility in our streets. That's been one of the huge pluses, I think, in Brussels and across Europe. We see more people taking their bikes, more people walking, the authorities responding with bike lanes and, and pedestrianized zones and, and local speed limits. Um, and if we're not careful, people will be too scared to take public transport. They'll jump back in their cars. And, and as a result, people will be too scared to walk or take their bikes. And we will have a, uh, we will go from, from lockdown to gridlock. Uh, it's not an original phrase, but it's one I'm using uh, uh, regularly. And then on the Green Deal, um, if I may say just two words on that. Um, it will be very easy for, for an institution like the European Commission to say, Oh, well, everything's off now with COVID. We've got to uh, get the economy back on its feet. We have to uh, uh, get back to the old normal as quickly as possible. And please note that the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has not taken that line. In her recent State of the Union speech, she restated the, the targets that we have to reduce 90% of our uh, uh, transport emissions uh, by 2050. That means at least a 55% reduction by 2030. And why? Because 25% of our emissions are, are coming from transport, 
20% just from road transport alone. So we can't postpone that by one year, by one day. And so we'll be coming forth, uh, as you mentioned, with the sustainable uh, mobility, sustainable and smart mobility strategy, which takes its cue from that pledge from President von der Leyen. We're not backing down. It's a false dichotomy to talk about the economy on the one hand versus uh, um, uh, 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 the Green Deal on the other. We will come with proposals to make all of our modes sustainable, to give us, and, and recognizing that some modes are going to take longer than others, to make sure we have sustainable alternatives available and that those alternatives are properly incentivized, which means, frankly speaking, bringing the market to transport, making sure that there is road pricing so that the true external costs, which Annika has also mentioned, of uh, road transport are borne by the users and not by society. The costs of CO2 emissions, the costs of uh, terrible air quality, the costs of congestion, the cost of road crashes, all of these things add up to 1 trillion euros a year. And it is time, high time, that we really uh, uh, dealt with those um, uh, 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 and really started to internalize them in the terrible jargon of transport economists. Um, the last point, of course, is that the cities and what we do about cities, the urban dimension to transport is going to flow logically, I think, from the um, S, the sustainable and smart mobility strategy. And we will come forward next year with plans to revamp our urban mobility package, which has been around since 2013. It's a magnificent um, set of uh, ideas already, but we're going to advance them, develop them and rethink them also in the context of the 10T regulation. Um, Annika mentioned the international, sorry, the international, the European Year of Rail. Um, that's going to be an exciting event on 2021 and a key part of our sustainability agenda. So I just, I, I want to pause on these uh, introductory remarks by saying, full steam ahead. There is no alternative. We must make progress. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for this excellent uh, view from the Commission. Um, I would like to come back to get back to to Annika now with uh, a sort of first take on the expectations on uh, some of the proposals that have been mentioned. And then we would uh, go back to to Georges to have a uh, an overview of what Belgium plans actually imply. The European Ra Year of, of Rail has actually been mentioned uh, now twice already. We will certainly talk about the role of of, of, tra of trains and, and railways. Um, but first of all, Annika, what is your what is your take on the European Green Deal and especially obviously the transport side of it, the the forthcoming um, a sustainable mobility strategy, but also the uh, sort of revamping exercise that uh, Matthew has mentioned with the urban you, mobility you package. Favor of the European Commission's proposal, aren't you, Annika? <laughs> Sorry, I, what did you say, Matthew? I cheekily said you are in favor of the European Commission's proposals, although you haven't yet seen them. <laughs> um, I can't subscribe to that. I'm, I'm uh, only a believer once I see it on paper. Uh, no, I think that um, I'm very proud of your uh, commission president. I mean, I was uh, I was so delighted when I also heard a recent uh, address to the European Parliament in which she stated we need a green recovery. It was a really inspiring speech. So I'm happy that you have this kind of leader at the moment and that she's taking this line that you mentioned. Um, we are always a little bit critical um, when it comes to you know, um, which solutions in the end will have the largest benefit. And of course, in, in transport and especially rail, the infrastructure costs are huge. And we are very grateful for all the contributions that the Commission has already done in this field. Um, it is absolutely necessary because it takes such a long time to prepare the network of tomorrow to continue and to, um, to perhaps increase the infrastructure investments. Um, we need, you know, to, to look at the 10T network, obviously, but also missing links and new cross-border connections that can um, connect cities or towns that are currently not connected to the railway network. Um, we, can, we can link these up. We need to modernize uh, the transport system. And especially in railways, let me mention the uh, automated digital coupling, which could be a fair project for the Commission to take on and to support across Europe, because this can really boost uh, the rail freight and make it more efficient and faster and uh, more uh, auto autonomous in the end. Um, so I think there, you know, in terms of infrastructure, there's a lot to be done. Also, um, when we look at buses, we need uh, 
charging and refueling uh, for alternative fuels for the buses. Uh, we need this infrastructure and there's an opportunity for Europe to help us when they um, work on the DAFI directive. Um, but we are a little bit skeptical um, sometimes when it comes to uh, you know, looking at technology and especially at the digitalization to solve some of these problems, because in the end, um, you know, whether or not a customer can get his ticket through a uh, large IT platform or from the public transport operator, um, this is just the side of ticket selling. But um, behind this is a physical transport and we need to ensure that the physical transport uh, the you know movement from A to B is done through sustainable modes of transport in you know both in freight and in passenger transport, and this has to remain at the center of all the deliberations because this is what will bring about the change. And so I'm happy about uh, you know Commission tackling road charges. Um, we are also interested in uh, energy prices, although this is not uh, a DG move dossier per se. But I think you know that if we look at uh, the taxation of fossil fuels that. Um, should, is likely to increase, then um, look at how uh, public transport and railways are um, taxed uh, with, you know, possibly lower rates or exemptions because of their um, sustainability advantage uh, that can that can help uh, the model shift as well. Um, yes, and in terms of the sustainable urban mobility package, we are very, very happy that this already exists and we're looking forward to the revision next year. Um, I think it's absolutely key to strengthen public transport authorities wherever possible. And I think an association like Polis mentioned once that it's those uh, uh, that public transport authorities that have a sustainable urban mobility plan that were the fastest to respond to the COVID crisis and to make, let's say, um, a good use of the opportunities that were in the lockdown. And so um, this was just one example that showed how relevant these plans are. And I think they will be um, increasingly important in the future. Also, when it comes to linking uh, cities with the environment, uh, with the rural areas that surround them, to improve these links, because commuting is responsible for a large part of the traffic and um, you know people commute people who live in the city are often able to live um, without their own private car as long as they move within the city but then if they want to leave the city or those who live around it want to enter the city um, that's where um, a lot of car traffic is generated thank yeah. you thank you very much Annika uh, speaking of authority as you mentioned it um, back to back to George now um, just to maybe put this a bit in, in perspective uh, and, and to avoid also that we have a, a conversation that uh, is, is typically Brussels based and in, in, in our perspectives. Um, George, you have, as you as you mentioned that you've taken over the role as, as, a, as the Minister for Mobility in Belgium some roughly six weeks ago. So that's a very paradox, paradoxical situation where you take over the role um, in a situation do you take over the role of a mobility minister in a situation where there's a global standstill? There's nothing moving, actually, uh, which which uh, is kind of a paradox for me. So uh, I just wanted to 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 know um, what are your plans now for? Because at, let me rephrase this: we as a as a, a German Green Foundation would obviously dream uh, of of a of a green uh, minister for transport. If if we look to Germany and and the kind of experience we had on a on a political level, uh, we can only say there's a lot of hope. Uh, if we look into your direction and 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 see a, a green transport minister, so um, I would be just interested. What kind of strategies? What kind of priorities would you like to to set during the during your ruling term now? I think we I think we can't hear you, uh, Josh might have to unmute yourself. I said, mm -hmm. thank you for your words. This is also a lot of pressure from me, uh, so so much uh, hope, but, but we will do uh, our, our best. And as, as you said, it's, it's quite a paradoxical situation. Um, as Minister of the Mobility, I need to ensure that buses and train uh, operate. And I uh, want to have more people on the train and bus of by bike and, and so on. And in the meantime, as a deputy prime minister, I must make sure that people stay and walk from home to uh, uh, to strike against the, 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 the COVID. 
but, but uh, joke aside, next Tuesday I will present to the Belgian uh, halls of rep representative my plan, my plans, sorry, for for the future of mobility in Belgium. And as a Green Minister, I want to be uh, the Minister of Trains, the Minister of Bikes, the Minister of Co Mobility, not the Minister of uh, Cars, uh, as you uh, as you know. Uh, uh, the coalition agreements f with uh, the, the other parties here in Belgium foresees huge investment for trains. Uh, it uh, was uh, needed in order to have more people and goods transport by uh, by rail. Um, as you you know, that it's better for environment, for environment, people's health, and even the economy. Uh, car traffic and congestion costs uh, every year between uh, one to two percent to the Belgium GDP, and it's responsible in Belgium for over uh, ten thousand premature deaths. Um, speaking of trends, uh, we we want to adopt and it's needed a long-term perspective because uh, investment in, in the train sector takes years to be discussed, negotiated and implemented. And my ambition is to have, uh, like in other countries like Switzerland, like uh, 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 I think uh, also uh, Austria, uh, my ambition is to have uh, a train every 30 minutes in every station in the country and every 10 minutes uh, around the, 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 the greatest uh, cities like Brussels or uh, Antwerpen. Um, I'm also committed to the modal transfer, uh, to the shift from the use of the private car to other means of transport. You know that in Belgium uh, there are uh, too much, too many uh, cars to, uh, have given to uh, workers as a, as a loan. It's for us a problem. A loan must must be paid in euro, not in cars or fuel. Uh, this uh, uh, you have to uh, have more public transport stations such as buses and train of or car sharing. Also, besides, uh, we should also collectively. Rethink the way to we move in uh, the uh, aftermath of the pandemic of COVID-19. Working from all from home must be uh, like in other country uh, encouraged while keeping a clearly defined work-life uh, balance. Um, like in other country or or, com or highway company has suffered from the COVID crisis uh, in the coalition agreement. We have uh, foreseen an amount of uh, 300 million euro to cover the loss of revenue induced by the COVID. And I'm uh, working to have uh, billions uh, in investment and investment, sorry, uh, in, in the rate for the, for the, for the future. Uh, we have planned further investment to make trains the center of our uh, future uh, mobility and we are working uh, in, in the, to to be ready as a country uh, to uh, work in the in the sorry uh, in the next generation plan for, from uh, Europe and in the Green Deal uh, to to get, to to receive a. Uh, um, to be able to do that, sorry. Besides, I welcome the initiative of the European Commission to make uh, uh, 2001 and 20 the European Year of Rail. Uh, more people and goods transport by rail is a goal uh, we shared with uh, with our government. Um, and uh, speaking of, of, of a better railway connection to go to Europe, we want to relaunch night train. In Europe, uh, when I was younger, I recall visiting capital cities of Europe connected by night trains. Uh, uh, it was a cool way to promote an, our continent and, it, and our diversity. And we have to uh, have more connection between uh, uh, Brussels and, uh, and the other country, la like uh, uh, like there's those of the people who are listen uh, listening to to us. Great, thank you very much, Josh. Um, speaking of now rail and and the, the the question of what kind of priorities would you set you mentioned that trains are definitely going to be at the center of, of your priorities um i uh, just wanted to, to give the chance to 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 matthew uh first to to comment a little bit on on the on the kind of expectations we will 
see with the European Year of Rail because if you talk about if you talk to some of the stakeholders, it is something that uh, has a kind of mitigated um, uh, resonance here in, in the Brussels um, community. But maybe Matthew you could uh, talk about a couple of points, and before I then hand over back to to Annika, we will then take a couple of questions from the comment sections. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, no, I, again, uh, we're struggling to find things to disagree on, but let me um, uh, amplify some points here made uh, by, by George and by Annika. On the European Year of Rail, I mean, it is, it has got, we shouldn't oversell it. It is going to be a year of promotion and a year of explanation and, and publicity for this vital means of transport. We want to put it in the spotlight. Um, uh, we've got agreement now between the Parliament and the Council on how much we can fund it, and it's going to be a a decent amount of funding to enable us to do a whole series of projects and events and and uh, um, and initiatives to promote rail. Three specific things, which I think are quite neat. One is that we're going to, to do some feasibility studies on a role to measure rail connectivity. This is this elusive concept, um, but it's very important once you get outside cities because too often, including in Belgium, if I may say, Minister, sometimes you struggle to get connecting points uh, by rail so the people who want to use the trains can't always do that. The second is the idea of a European label to promote goods and products that are transported by rail, which is a neat idea. Um, and then last but not least, to underline again what we have already done and how we should use more, the European policy for rail, uh, the fourth railway package um, is about trying to develop new competition on the railways to reduce the cost to reduce the administrative burdens for companies on the rail and um, we've got a provisional agreement on the fourth railway package we now need to see that blessed by the parliament and council before it comes into force the point on funding which the minister touched on is is hugely important and whenever i talk about transport um in my sort of over enthusiastic way people say well that's great but where's the money and now i've got the answer um on top of existing flows through the CEF, the Connecting European Facility, on top of the money that flows through cohesion funding, we have this new exciting kid on the block called the Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility, which is a 750 billion euro honeypot. And it's wonderful for me the first time to be able to address directly a minister with responsibility for this, because the ball is now in the court of the member states to establish their plans um, and we are here in DG Move passionately in support of investments in railways, in public transport. We want to signal that, in our view, this RRF funding can be used for things like bike lanes, uh, can be used in cities, um, and it can be used because um, it's about not just the, the, the green transition, but the jobs transition. And when you look at things like the um, employment uh, intensity of building a bike lane, it's 130% in terms of its employment effect of normal road spending. So build a bike lane in Brussels or in Liège or anywhere else, and you get immediately an attraction for active mobility and you get people back to work. And these things can also be done quite quickly. They are shovel ready in our terrible in our terrible jargon um annika mentioned the last point martin i will stop annika mentioned the the sumps the sustainable urban mobility plans we do want to develop them we're very proud of this uh, model that's existed since 2013 there are over a thousand sustainable urban mobility plans and we want to do more to integrate public transport and active mobility again the sustainable alternatives to using your private car in the city. But you make an important point about the connection between the urban and the periurban, the rural areas. Because look, if we're realistic, for many years to come, the car is going to carry on being ubiquitous outside the city. So how do we manage that hinge between the cities and the rural areas? Yes, it's about better public transport, and Minister, we'd love to see it. But also it's about pragmatic alternatives like car parks on the edge of cities with, with free public transport or free use of a bike to come into the city so you don't have to bring your car in and that way we can increase the incentive on people not to use their cars in cities and that is a, a big big plus thanks thank you matthew and uh, now back to annika maybe you would like to comment on on uh, george's and, and and matthew's um inputs um and then yeah, yeah you could you could <laughs> go ahead um and then i'll ask a couple of questions from the from the comment section just please um 
keep in mind that we uh, are clo like slowly but, but steadily coming to an end now. So please try to yeah. be as, as concise as possible. Thank you. Absolutely. No, I was just very impressed by George's um, statements and, and his, um, you know, uh, sharing the experience of what they're planning to do in Belgium, putting rail at the center of the mobility system. And um, that is that is wonderful. And I'm impressed because I was thinking, um, you know, how can we win back the passengers? I think we need uh, two uh, things. We need information. So we have to communicate a lot, a lot, a lot about um, how safe is it to use public transport, about the hygiene measures that are ta being taken, about the low risk of transmission when all people wear their mask and uh, and so on. And we in VDV were actually having a huge campaign about this um, to help the whole sector and together with the ministries to, to communicate about this point. But the other element is to working on the capacities of the system and uh, in a way preparing for the modal shift. So uh, for the time being, we need capacities to enable people to stay, uh, to keep uh, you know, the, the distance that they need in order to avoid transmission of the virus. So right now the vehicles are relatively empty and um, it is still possible. But once people come back, we want to have more capacities. We want to have more capacities in Germany, for instance, for the students that go to school, because at peak hours, then the buses are very full. So we start, uh, you know, seeing additional buses added. And, um, and the same applies to all other types of vehicles. So if we work on the modal shift, like you do in Belgium at the moment, and you start creating these capacities and improving the system, um, this will help you also in the long term. It will help in the short term because of the distances that can be kept, but in the long term, because once people, you know, take up mobility again and are moving around, you want to ensure that more people can be taken in railways and trams and metros and so on. Okay, thank you very much, Annika, and also thank you for, for being um, brief. Um, now, I'd, I'd like to, I would like to get um, some of the questions that have been have been posted in in the comment sections. Um, maybe I'll start off with the with a reversed order to uh, to get George um, back back on um, in, in in this um, in this round now because this I think this question is specifically asked from a Belgian perspective. Uh, let me just read it out loud. Um, it's ambi ambition to phase out fiscal advantage for salary cars in Belgium is not reflected in the governmental agreement. Will you be able to still make a change on this important issue for Belgian mobility? I think, yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, <laughs> it was my first, my, my beginning. Uh, Salary cars are a huge problem in Belgium. It's, it's, uh, each year, uh, the, the European Commission uh, says to, to Belgium, there is, you have a problem you, you, with your salary cars. There, were, there are too many cars in Belgium and uh, too many salary cars. And, and this a bit uh, a part of our history, of our social history. It was uh, a way to, to give people... Uh, loans but uh, without uh, the, the charge of uh, social uh, charge of, of of the loans and we have to get out of the the, the system uh, as greens we are uh, it's uh, it's our um, it's what we want uh, but it's difficult to find other parties to to do that uh, so fast that 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 we want the our um, our agreement uh, uh, to go uh, in a government is if two important things about uh, salary cars. First of all, is you have to electrify the, the, the system. Uh, there are questions uh, about it, but uh, you have to have uh, less uh, polluting uh, cars uh, on, on the way. Uh, salary cars, but we want to change the system with a global uh, fiscal uh, reform, which makes that you are uh, you you pay people in euro and not in 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 cars. As a minister for for mobility in Belgium, I have to to work to to give people the the freedom of uh, not taking their car to have a, a good system of, of trains to have uh, uh, li like was said a station where you can come with a bike take a train and take a bus 
take uh, uh, a dealt car, a shared, sorry, a shared uh, a system of sharing car for the, the, the last the, the last kilometers, uh, and we are working on it uh, to to make a, a revolution about uh, about it. And I, I think another another question is uh, uh, the. Uh, the, the trains who are uh, starting earlier and uh, uh, finishing uh, in the in the night, uh, because if you want that people uh, uh, make the choice not to have uh, their own cars, you have to give a, a good service, a good uh, mobility service, and we are working on it. And with here in Brussels, with a lot of. Uh, New companies who are thinking the the future of mobility as a service, not as a, uh, it's that you are that uh, you have to to buy like a car who uh, cost a lot, uh, who are was taking a lot of place in our, our streets, who are polluting. But it's a revolution. We have to um, to help people to change their mind, uh, and it's my my. What I have to do as a as a new minister for mobility to give uh, another vision of the mobility. Thank you, George. And now uh, maybe a comment from from Matthew on on George's points. But uh, also, I'd like to link that with a, a, a comment from from our views. Um, there's one comment in the section uh, here, um, which is about um, the the road pricing policies. So the question was, what should we expect from road pricing policies in the smart and sustainable mobility strategy? considering the Euro vignette reform is already underway, albeit very slowly. So that question, maybe you could link that or refer to that one uh, later, Matthew, and then maybe a, just a, a general comment on, on what you've heard from, from, from George. Yeah, I'll try and pick these up uh, generally. I'm very interested to hear what the minister said there. And I thought, honestly, if you listen to that objectively, it's such a fair statement of what you said. Um, and, and underlying it, if I may, and not to put words into your mouth, Minister, it's not about demonizing individual car drivers, but making sure that we give them the package of incentives and alternatives so that things change. And I think sometimes the polemic, including right now in Brussels, gets so out of whack as if people uh, are, are deliberately trying to make life difficult for car drivers or whatever. It's not. It's about trying to create a sustainable and a green city. So first of all, yes, we do keep beating you up on this question about uh, about the salary cars uh, in our in the European uh, semester process. And to be fair, you're also not alone in that. Um, go to a green city like Copenhagen. There's a lot of cars coming into Copenhagen every day. Uh, and they like to pretend they're always on their bicycles. So you're not completely alone. And what you're talking about there is giving people the incentives to do things differently. We are very keen on our side to help you do that by providing the right framework to facilitate these things, to fund, uh, again, back to the Recovery and Resilience Fund, please make sure that Belgium comes heavily with lots and lots of green transport things. I'm and, working uh, on it. I'm working. Uh, thank you very much. I'm <laughs> right with you. Um, and, um, uh, and we will try to do our part as good citizens of Belgium. In the Commission, sometimes we sit there, you know, these overpaid uh, Eurocrats, but we have made a commitment, which not a lot of people have picked up on, to green the Commission, carbon neutral Commission by 2030. So we're looking forward to uh, discussing, I guess, firstly with the region of Brussels, but why not also with the federal authorities, to look at the different areas in terms of our, our commuting, in terms of our energy efficiency of buildings, all of those things are on the table because we have to. Uh, if we're thinking globally about, you know, the European Green Deal, we also have to act locally. Um, so um, now then the tricky question coming for me. So what about road pricing in the in the mobility strategy? And and Hannah, in your question, you're right. Uh, the Euro vignette reform is a, a, a slow work in progress. Again, I think the goal here is not for the European Union to tell everyone what to do, but to provide the right framework, the facilitating framework to enable the external costs to be challenged. I don't think we'll get very far if we say everyone's got to do road pricing. You've got to do it now and you've got to do it this way. We have to find a framework which actually enables people to do it successfully. And I think so, Eurovignette's a good framework for that. Um, we also, uh, we are looking with interest at what's happening with urban vehicle access restrictions and, and, and to see if there's ways we can do that. But also there's some pressures on us to try to harmonize urban vehicle access restrictions as well. So they're done on comparable principles and more understandable to, to, to users. So lots of things we can do in partnership with 
probably the last thing I'll get to say, with the public transport authorities, with the, uh, the, the, the member states, uh, and of course, with all stakeholders. And I'll shut up now. And thanks for the chance to join the panel. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I will now hand the floor over back to, to Annika and then I'll also um, give her the chance to uh, answer to, first of all, one last question and also make a final statement for this round so we can conclude this, uh, this fun fantastic panel. Thank you. So the question, first of all, is maybe you've partly answered it a bit, but uh, you can come back to that. Statistics show that people tend to prioritize a car over public transport in the current situation. Are there already strategies being developed or maybe applied as well to make them use public and transport to, to make them use public transport again? Okay, yeah. Um, so if this refers to the COVID situation, then I think I've already mentioned a little bit what we are trying to do is to communicate very clearly um, and to look into the first of all, the question is there a risk in public transport and how can we mitigate it? And then to be very open about the measures that are taken by our members and uh, about the risk and the fact that there is currently no um, no elevated risk in using public transport. So it is relatively safe if you take the necessary uh, measures like wearing a mask. Um, we are ensuring that people wear the mask because obviously you can wear your mask, but you may be concerned that others don't. So controls play a role and we're in contact with the authorities to ensure that there are fines attached to it if you don't wear a mask. Um, so this is, but this is going relatively well. I can speak for Germany here, but really the people are, are doing all of this. So I think that rebuilding trust to communication is one thing. And then to ensure uh, that over the long term, we've got the capacities to, um, you know, to attract people to transport by making, giving them those space and making it convenient and, you know, using more, more digital tools as well that can enhance the system overall. I mean, that is the second step after COVID and globally is to make public transport more attractive, um, to make it the number one choice of citizens if they think uh, I need to get from A to B, how do I do that? Thank you, Annika. Now for Josh, a uh, last uh, remark from, from your side, maybe a couple of perspectives. Uh, yes, I was very uh, pleased to, to be there. As I said uh, at the beginning, I'm, I'm here from six weeks. It was a lot of work to, to be uh, ready we are with my, my team, was still not complete. Uh, but we are, we are working uh, for um, uh, introducing uh, projects uh, in the next generation uh, program from the from the European Union and it's very uh, important for us to to give money back to the railway and uh, to give a, a better uh, service for, for for the people and to uh, create the, the the new mobility and my uh, my slogan was uh, uh, we we have said for a long time um, my car is my mobility my, my my car is my freedom i want to say my train is my freedom i want to liberate people from their care their own car you you uh, always need a, a car but you don't need to to be the owner of your car you have uh, to to receive a mobility as a service and we want to to create this in belgium and i am very pleased to to receive the confidence of the the people and the government to to and the middle to 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 do it but uh, i hope uh, i can be no, uh, still uh, more concrete in a, a few months and uh, come back to a webinar to to told you to tell you uh, what we have uh, achieved to to do Thank you very much, George. We're looking forward to that and we wish you uh, all the best for this very exciting and, and I think also very challenging mission. Um, maybe, Matthew, a, a, a last word from your side? Well, I said too much, but seeing as you asked me, looking forward to working with the Minister on Mobility as a Service. We didn't talk about the digital side of this and uh, uh, we think that's a hugely uh, incentivizing uh, possibility. And noting Annika's concerns about uh, that, I'm, I'm kind of like you, and I'm also pretty analog as a person. Let's let's also do the things we know we can do now, as well as looking at some of these other alternatives. But I think there's some great possibilities. Looking forward to working with you all on this.
Okay, then it's my pleasure to conclude this this fantastic panel today. Thank you very much to all of the speakers. Thank you very much for for listening and and being active in, in the comments. We're looking forward to host other events together with the. Also, thank you very much, uh, my colleagues from the Green European Foundation, and um, and here my colleagues at HBS. Have a good afternoon. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.